Now that we have covered the block structure, let us look at the chain structure and how it is formed. To start with, an array is a data structure that statically allocates sequential blocks of memory under a common head. What does that mean? It means that when you initialize an array, a fixed amount of memory is indexed and allotted for that structure to store multiple elements of the same type to it. While other languages like C++ and Java require you to declare the size of the array also at initialization. JavaScript has no such boundations and thus there is no need to declare the size beforehand. Now you must be wondering why did we start with an array structure? You guessed it right, linked list, which is what blockchain data structures are is like an array but with a difference. To understand the linked list, we must link it with its constitution. A linked list is essentially also a data structure which consists of a list of elements. However, a linked list constitutes of each element having a reference pointing to the next element whereas an array has nothing of this sort. This allows linked list to dynamically allocate memory, which means the position of the next element is a linked list is assigned during runtime. Thus, a linked list is considerably faster and more efficient than an array. Let us understand this again using a process in which an ant colony approaches food. An ant initially senses the presence of food which cannot be retrieved by it individually. It then returns with other ants. Every ant follows the ant in front of it. Now it is entirely possible that at every place a few of these ants can either be removed or be placed additionally. Every ant is linked to its predecessor in the sense that it follows its trail. And so in order to determine the position of an ant, we must locate the ant right before it. Interesting, isn't it? Link lists work more or less the same way as ants in an ant colony. Every element of the trail or the link list points to the next element. This way, in order to add an element, we can simply add a reference in the current element which points to another new element which comes next. This indicates a dynamic memory, unlike an array where the number of elements needs to be specified in the initial declaration, like we mentioned before. A linked list is linked in the sense that each element has a tail called pointer, pointing towards the next element. Likewise, a blockchain consists of a chain of blocks linked with each other, except that the pointer in the blockchain is the hash as has been described earlier. The diagram depicts a typical linked list structure. Please note that the linked list data structures and blockchain data structures are similar but not the same. An important thing to know is that a blockchain is essentially a continuously growing list of records. This list is immutable in the sense that no deletion or alteration is permitted. However, the linked list by its uses offers ease pertaining to deletion and modification of data. You might be wondering then why we even compared the two. The reason being to give you an understanding of how traversion and allocation of memory is analogous in blockchain and linked lists and how the data blocks are connected. It is important to remember that both are used in very different circumstances. Every chain has to start somewhere, right? Now the question is, which is the first block in a blockchain? The first block in any blockchain is called a genesis block. It is similar to other blocks, but with one big difference. And what is that difference? Well, the previous block address in the genesis block is null or blank. Genesis block is also known as the block zero or the origin block. A genesis block 
mainly defines the initial parameters of the blockchain, which include the level of difficulty, the consensus algorithm to be applied, etc. We already know that it is the only block in the network which wouldn't point to any previous block because there isn't any. There is a possibility that it may not contain any transactions. It differs from a typical block in the way in which it is created. Genesis block is generally hard-coded into the network's clients. The clients play a significant role in the creation of the rest of the blocks. So, what is the significance of the Genesis block? Genesis block plays a significant part in setting up the blockchain network. Any node will only be able to connect to the blockchain network if it has the same Genesis block as the rest of the nodes on the network. Creating a Genesis block does not necessarily mean that the blockchain is off to a great start. It is just a start. More work follows in regards to building the community, getting network miners on board, and enabling peer-to-peer -peer transactions. A trivia for you all. In the case of Bitcoin, the next block after the Genesis block was created after six days. Let us now look at the transaction lifecycle in a blockchain. It is important for us to know how the blockchain-based transaction differs from a traditional transaction. Let us see this from transfer of money transaction. We will see how the transfer of money works with well-known instruments such as credit cards or bank transfers and how it compares to its blockchain-enabled equivalent. A traditional money transaction can be summarized into three steps, authorization, clearing, and settlement. So what is authorization? We all know Amazon and must have bought something from them sometime. If we were to purchase a book from Amazon, sometime it takes a couple of clicks to purchase a book and other times you would use what Amazon calls the one click purchase. Now, you might ask yourself, how does Amazon know that you have enough money to buy the book? Amazon's bank sends a request to your bank to check whether you have enough money to buy this book. Your bank can then approve that you have the necessary amount. If it does, one can say that the transaction has now been authorized. Now, you can receive the book and the receipt but the transaction between Amazon's bank and your bank has not been completed. This will happen in the later stages where you as the customer are no longer directly involved. Next is clearing. Once the authorization has been completed, the transaction has to be cleared. This means Amazon's bank sends the purchase information to your bank. This exchange of information is required to verify the amount that you owe to Amazon. Correspondingly, in this stage of the transaction lifecycle, Amazon's bank can submit their claims, which in turn is verified by your bank's validation system to determine that the information is correct. This process is known as clearing. And then the settlement. The last step in the transaction life cycle is the actual movement of funds from the buyer's account to the Amazon's bank account. The posting of credits and debits in the accounts is based on the clearing data and involves interactions from the financial institution and the settlement bank as well as your bank and Amazon's bank. Important to note is the interchange fee. You do not pay your bank to complete the payment, but Amazon has to pay their bank. Therefore, this fee is necessary to incentivize banks from issuing cards to customers. The diagram explains the typical credit card based purchase or transaction cycle. You will note the number of intermediaries and steps from the moment the card is presented to the customer until the final settlement is done. Now, let us see the life cycle of a transaction on the blockchain. Bitcoin's underlying technology proposes a new way of handling interactions between customers and suppliers. 
This new way is a decentralized ledger that is handled by an algorithm which is run by a multitude of servers or computers rather than multiple layers of intermediaries. This in turn decreases the rate of errors committed by social functions. As everybody has access to this ledger, it builds trust based on the decentralized network and removes as much direct human involvement as possible. Re-examining the example above, the purchase of a new book at Amazon will look quite differently. If you decide to use the Bitcoin payment option, the transaction life cycle can be summarized as follows. The Bitcoin transaction is sent or broadcast to all participating computers in the specified blockchain network. Every verifying computer that is full node in the network checks the transaction against some validation rules that are run by each verifying computer in the network. For example, the verifying computer will check your current balance to make sure you have enough money for the broadcast transaction. It is very important that the verifying users are not able to deduce that you are buying a book. Hence, some privacy is provided. If the conditions specified in the rules have been met, transactions are stored in a block and cryptographically sealed with help of a specialized algorithm dedicated to this process. This process is also known as mining. The newly mined block is broadcast to every computer in the network. The computers check the block against some specific validation rules, that is, if the seal on the block is valid, and propagate it to their peers if valid. Each verifying computer in the network that receives notice of the new block being mined checks the block against specific validation rules and adds it to their memory of the longest chain. Now the transaction is part of the blockchain and cannot be altered in any way. The verification and settlement happens with no direct human involvement and is thus less prone to human error than the traditional approach. Also, the blockchain powered scheme operates without any trusted third parties and is highly transparent for every user, yet pseudonymous.